David began collecting stamps as a child. While there was a period of reduced activity, his collecting never truly went dormant. His father had had an Australian pen pal, and as a result, the primary focus has always been on Australasia. David also became involved in the Society of Australasian Specialists and spent many days being mentored by the late Ed Williams of Buffalo, New York. During a summer job in New Zealand, he was introduced to the stamps of Papua and formed a collection of Papuan official stamps and mail that eventually received a verme at the Australia 99 International. Later between terms at university, David, tra David traveled to and worked in New Zealand. His job often required working late and on his supper break, David took some time out, sorry, and on his supper break, David took some time out to uh, an up the back stairs stamp shop in Auckland. Interesting. He and the old crusty shop owner would discuss the state of the world in stamps. One evening, David was presented with a package of stamps and told he could not look but he was assured he would love the contents and could have the package for 20, uh, 20 New Zealand dollars. David took a break and still had many of these stamps in his collection. This purchase formed the basis of his collection of Papuan official stamps and mail that eventually received, received a gourmet at Australia 99 International. David has semi-dormant exhibits of official stamps and mails of British New, Ga uh, British New Guinea, sorry, British New Guinea and Papua International. Again, that's the Verme. The traveling post offices of Queensland, International Verme and a national goal. The squared circle cancellations of the Northern Territory of Australia. It's a one frame which won some special prizes. The AAPE title page, and a national goal. Postal use of the 1978 trees issue of Australia. Again, a one frame exhibit which received a national verme. He has C of A perfins used in Great Britain, which he received a national verme. David is a former vice president and former librarian of the Society of Australasian Specialists slash Oceana. Oceana and former vice president of the Papuan Philatelic Society. In real life, David is an engineer and principal with Blue Metric Environmental, an environmental cons consulting engineering firm. He also is an avid interest in sports and formerly coached and managed one of the better amateur men's soccer teams in Ontario and one of the <laughs> okay, and one of the worst girls, girls under 15 teams. He is also one of the 355 international ski officials who supervise all international alpine races. Uh, I, I introduce you to David Hopper, whose uh, subject is Queensland, a philatelic miscellany. This is the philatelic miscellany is kind of a lazy way out. I didn't want to spend forever trying to make a detailed exhibit or uh, presentation about something so I thought I'll give you a little bit of everything um, and really is a little bit of everything I think the last third of this presentation qualifies in that edge of philately category that I heard about um, simplified history um, the Aboriginals have been there for a long time lots of argument about when that was Queensland was probably the most densely populated Australian state in the Aboriginal times before the Europeans came along. The Aboriginals had no concept of postal service. There's no postal items associated with that. They have a thing called message sticks. They contain no message, but were a symbol of authority that you should listen to the messenger recite the message. The, the, it was just an indication that he was gonna recite what was there. Then the Europeans played around. 1606 to 1823, you've got the age of exploration. Dutch, Spanish, French, English, all working up and down the east coast of Australia, running into the west coast sometimes, running into New Guinea, finding New Zealand, all that kind of stuff. Some of the explorers' names, you know, the, the Torres, the Torres Strait between Australia and New Guinea, Bougainville, which gives its name to lots of things. Captain Cook, everybody's heard of him. Um, and uh, 
Flinders, Matthew Flinders, was one of the main explorers of Australia. As you know, Australia was where England got rid of the people they didn't want in England anymore. It was a penal colony. Most of these people were fairly boring criminals. They stole not very much, but they were sentenced to seven years in Australia. Seven, transportation for seven years to Australia. Canada at one time too, but after a while, North America got too civilized, so they had to send them to Australia. Um, eventually, a permanent location was selected and called Morton Bay. It's now the central business district of Brisbane. So Morton Bay was the first real settlement in Queensland. When it was formed, it was part of New South Wales. There was only New South Wales initially. New Zealand was part of New South Wales. New South Wales was the, the, the state now was a much different entity then. Oh. And then in 1859, the colony of Queensland appeared, was proclaimed. So from 1830 to December 59, postage stamps and markings of New South Wales were used. The postmark makes them distinct as to what they are. Then you've got the postage stamps of New South Wales used in the colony of Queensland when it converts. It took them from 1859 to 1860 to order stamps and get them from England. It's a long way from England to Australia in a clipper ship, even a good clipper ship in the day. And then after 1860, you have the postage stamps of Queensland. In 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia was formed, welded together the six states that became the Commonwealth of Australia. But it took them until 1912 to agree on a joint stamp date issue and to disentangle their postage and revenue systems so the right money would go to the right state government. It took them a full, uh, a full 10 years. And then the kangaroo stamps framers showed up. There's not a lot of people in Queensland early on. 1883, there's only a quarter million people. Um, and because it's a census taken by Europeans, by people we mean white people who might write letters, not Aboriginals. But the Aboriginal population is getting decimated by disease and neglect and abuse anyway at this time as well. So there's really, their numbers are going down dramatically. White numbers are going up dramatically. Um, there's a picture of Queensland. You can see it's the upper right corner of Australia. Um, there are, um, on the map, you see my cursor? These, there's three railway lines that come into the center of the, of the state. Uh, if you've ever seen my TPO exhibit or my TPO talk, that those are the initial traveling post office rail lines. They come from inland where the grain and the cow and the ore, the cows and the ore is, and they take it to the coast to ship it down to Brisbane or further south to Sydney and other parts of Australia. So it's all, it's, Queensland's a very rich state agriculturally rich, lots of really good agricultural land, and also ore rich, iron ore, uh, nickel sulfide. The Mount Isa mine in Queensland is essentially equivalent to the Sudbury complex and the Norilsk complex in Russia. There are three virtually identical ore bodies with mines sitting on top of them, and they're giant, giant facilities. And there's lots of gold and everything else in Queensland. So there's the philatelic outline. I'll go through this as we go through and talk to you more about it. I'm skipping over hundreds of stamps to, to make it quick and simple. So initially, here's your Morton Bay markings. So you've got Brisbane, New South Wales. It's the capital of Queensland. So this is obviously from that period, 1855, I guess that is, 1856. Um, and there's also a numeral cancel, bar numeral cancel of 95. That's Brisbane in this time period and later time periods as well. But this is on the new stamps of New South Wales, so it's in the Morton Bay period. Um, more of them on different stamps, both the barred numeral and the numeral in rays. These are very standard cancellations. You can find them from 400 or 500 different post offices in <coughs> Queensland. Numeral cancels were very popular. They also had these oval obliterators Ovals with QL in the middle for Queensland or void ovals. So when you see me carefully looking through every New South Wales stamp at the stamp show, I'm looking for this stuff. And it appears quite surprisingly often in this part of the world. You would expect to never see it, but in fact, it pops up. 
other Morton Bay markings. Up here, it's for D R A Y T O N, Drayton. Um, New South Wales again. And 85 is this number. So here's the 85s from, uh, from Drayton. Again, these are not common markings. Um, you yeah, maybe go on eBay tonight. I don't think there's any on eBay currently. There's just none of them. Um, this one is interesting. It's got Ipswich, which is a Queensland town, New South Wales. It's got Goods Inn, which was a New South Wales, Queensland. It's right on the border. It's, I, yeah, I think uh, postal historians argue about which state it belongs to. And then uh, got the 86 of, of Gaida on here as well for these stamp, the same mark. Three Morton Bay postmarks in a single cover, pretty rare, pretty hard to find. Then the stamps of Queensland. So we start with the Shalon portrait. Every, you know, it's, it's on stamps all over the place. Um, very popular portrait, it's used repeatedly. So the first issues are printed in London. They're on large and small star watermarks, two, two different sides of a, of a six pointed star watermark. Paper was scrounged from other colonies. So the watermarks don't appear on the stamps necessarily. They're sort of on the stamps. They were first issued in perforate because they had to get to the colony as fast as they could. So they printed a bunch, put them in a package, sent them, no perforations. Then in the interim, they perforated them and sent the next batch perforated to the colony. Perforated three different machines, 14 to 16 clean cut, 14 to 14 to 16 rough. It's um, a very good cure for a nice evening is to try and sort this crap out. It gives you a headache in a hurry. Um, one of the original publications got perforation poles from the original perforating machines. So you can lay your stamps down on the original perforation poles at real size and see how they match up. That's the, really the only way to figure these out sometimes. These are the first issues. In Perfort, I like to collect them in pairs. I've never seen a six penny pair that I could afford. Um, the two penny is kind of interesting. There are seven known pairs of the two penny. Queen's got two and there's five more. I got one and there's four more. I don't know where the other four are hiding out. Um, this, I have a uh, certificate with this pair from the Royal Philatelic Society of London. It's a certificate for a strip of three which would be the largest extent multiple. Um, and I know that a dealer in Ontario cut one stamp off and sold it to somebody and then sold me the pair. Wow. Um, philatelic vandalism of the highest order. I mean, a strip of three has got to be a $30,000, $40,000 item in the open market. Painful. Do you still Pain. alive? Yeah. 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 I, I won't name names to protect the innocent here, but... Um, so I try to collect them in pairs. Got one here on cover. I'm pretty sure it's good. Um, a lot of my stuff comes from uh, uh, two collectors in the past. One is uh, Ed Williams from Buffalo. And Ed had a very good eye for forgeries and fakes. Um, so stuff in his, in his collection that's marked as forgery or fakes, I'm pretty sure is. And I've used that to guide me along. And a bunch of the stuff came from another guy named Hugh Campbell, who's a fairly major old time player in the Australian stamp in the philatelic world in Australia. And so if those two guys thought it was genuine, I'm pretty sure it is. Then they decided we can print this stuff in Brisbane. Why are we paying some guy in London to do this? We've got all these convicts kicking around. We've got labor. We should be able to print stamps. So um, whole range of papers and perforations, all manner of stuff goes on. Um, it's 100, over 100 numbers in Gibbons plus all the sub numbers. And I'm sure it'll be one or two pages in this philatelic miscellany. These are examples. This is the, uh, a registered stamp that was produced to pay the registration fee. A couple of posthumous plate proofs. There's, in the Australian states, there are all manner of posthumous prints made. After the after, Long after the issue, they're making, they'll print up a whole series of stamps face different stuff to send to the UPU when they joined the UPU in the late, late 1800s. So there's UPU sets that have all these oddball stamps in them. The other oddball thing is why would you ever need a pair of registered stamps? One stamp paid the registration fee. What did the second stamp pay? It doesn't make any sense, but 
there it is. I got one. Again, difficult to find on cover. Local, there's a two penny in, in country rate, six penny to England at the time. Um, almost all the mail is to the United Kingdom. England, Scotland, Ireland, virtually all the mail. Um, there was a major display. Hugh Campbell used to have an exhibit of pre-UPO Queensland mail not to England. And it was a real tour de force. It was a large gold winner at many, many shows. Um, again, this is in the 1870s to um, New York via Southampton. So it goes to England and then um, comes back or back over to New York. Again, incredibly rare cover um, because there's virtually no mail to that part of the world at that time. So Queensland decides they're going to make their own stuff. So they, they change to a surface printing method. So they take the, they'd have the die for the stamp and they would grow electroplate a piece on it. And then from that, they'd make another mold. So they end up with uh, a, a impression of the stamp that they'd grown through electroplating. Um, and in most cases, they made four of them and locked them together in a block of four. So there's type one, two, three, four, and they're published things that describe what's what and how they're different. Um, but this pattern of four repeats all over the sheet, except for where they had to fix something. So you know, every now and then you fall, you'll see the pattern pattern, it's all working, all working, and then the pattern stops. It's broken. And then you have to poke around and see what's been changed to make this pattern happen. Um, also large usage for revenue purposes as well as for postal purposes. So the Big squiggle through this guy is for revenue purposes. Nine shillings is probably an almost impossible postal rate for the time, but fiscally sure it's commonly used. So the other thing you got to do with these stamps is get x-ray vision to figure out when they've taken the fiscal cancel off. Um, another this side face is very difficult stamp to find on cover. There it is. And you'll see it's a different, we had originally a six pence to England, then we had an eight pence. Now we've got up to nine pence. The yo yo's all over the place. And some of the rates are time periods that you're measuring weeks before they change. They do an, an overprint, a half penny overprint. They were used to get from one penny to one and a half penny newspaper rate. They were valid for a single voyage on the, the, the post, they could stamping um, newspapers being returned to England on a single voyage only. So, um, Dated copies are almost impossible to find. None of mine have dates. They just have obliterators and nothing known on cover. They use bad stamps. So they're pretty heavily misperforated um, and put the overprint on these essentially scrap stamps. If you find one with the overprint reading downward, congratulations, you found a forgery. There are no genuine examples. They also had high value stamps because postage uh, in 1880, separate stamps for duty and postage were no longer in play. So you had high values. It could be you had stamps that were postage and revenue stamps. You see this in many countries in the uh, British Empire. I mean, Rhodesia has those 200 pound things that you can, um, that are supposedly useful on, useful on postage, but they're revenue stamps. So here you have um, the top row are all used with revenue cancels. Obvious, clear, well-known revenue cancels. Two shilling up to 10 shilling. The two 20 shillings down below where the real value is are completely fake. The cancellations are completely fake. And if you look at it, it's on the UV light, the old hand pen cancel shows up like a just shines out at you. So it's pretty obvious what they've done. Um, no genuine examples of the 20 shilling really used or known. And people try to sell you these all the time. And I get offered these fairly regularly because they have an exorbitant price tag in the catalog. But as a forgery, they're like, I, I'll give you 10 bucks. So no, not too many people ever sell them to me because of my attitude. Bradbury Wilkinson high values. Very nice looking set of stamps, I think. Um, a Bradbury Wilkinson traveling salesman was in Brisbane and somehow managed to talk himself into an order for these high value stamps. Um, 
Bradbury Wilkinson made the plates, shipped them to Brisbane. Brisbane printed the stamps at the, print, the government printing office in Queensland. They um, were printed on a very wide range of products, wide range of materials. Um, they're on, on issue from then to the end of the Queensland era, printed by recess printing and later lithography, five different papers, multiple perforating machines, specimen overprints, perforated OS, it would make a heck of a nice one frame exhibit if I could ever get around to pulling it together. Um, I don't have any proof material which would shoot it in the foot off the start, but I could probably get it to Vermeer. Main usage is, like I say, fiscal, not postal, but there is occasional postal usage. In the later part of the 1800s, the, the gold is discovered in many places in Australia. So high value stamps get used to ship gold from gold fields to banks, the big banks in the big cities. So they're not, it's not uncommon to see. <laughs> quite high value um, frankings on things for shipping gold parcels. But I have them on transfer shares for gold mining companies, Morgan, Mount Morgan Gold Mine, um, the share transfer certificates. Later, they switched to other side face stamps. The first ones were a little more primitive. These ones are a little more refined looking. The engravers the engravers that are being deported to Australia at this time, I guess, are better quality than the initial engravers they deported, um, something like that. They insist on printing through the years these stamps in this oh, god-awful yellow color. What denomination is that? Can you guys tell? That's a pretty good scan. Um, it's, it's a four pence, I can tell you that. But they're, they insist on doing it throughout, and it, it's just a terrible-looking stamp. These come in a whole bunch of variations. You've got um, the one penny on the bottom here. Then the next the next iteration has no shading inside the oval. So the queen's head's in a white background instead of a shaded background. The penny markings go on the four corners or the two corners. Um, so there's a whole raft of variations that go on. There are ones that have a G for, there's a penge. Um, there's one with an O instead of a U, so you got whatever QO Eensland is. Um, so lots and lots of variations there. Again, a couple hundred Gibbons numbers, so there's lots of stuff there if you ever want to dig into it. One of the things they did was put these bands on the back of the stamps as a security measure. Seems to me to be kind of a strange way to do a security measure because you've got to take the stamp off to find it. And they printed the bands after they gummed them. So if you soak this stamp, the band's gone. So you can no longer identify it as being that particular stamp. So it seems like a security measure designed by somebody who wasn't really thinking the whole thing through. Uh, but it's a worthwhile collectible thing. Again, the later, as I described in the later, the, the side face has changed. So this is, I just go through, happen to have a bunch of the half penny big pieces. So. It starts with a half pennies on either side of the queen's head. Then it becomes half pennies in four corners. Then it becomes a totally different design. And then they don't need half pennies anymore and they're done. Um, these are kind of fun to collect. If you look under the queen's ear, you see this big crack down in the plate? One there, one there, one there. This queen, the crack on the plate. Fairly constant, very constant um, flaw. I've got, I don't know, I got a couple dozen of those silly things. Again, it's another thing you can pick out of the average dealer here in Canada sometimes. Another thing to remember about Australian states mail in this period is they all have holes in them. See these holes? Australians are great gamblers. And the big lottery gambling house was a place called Tats, Tattersalls, in Hobart, Tasmania, was their headquarters. Everybody mail their bets in on the horse races, I'm guessing it was not. I, I, and they would, Pats would open the envelope, take out the the money and the betting slip, and they'd take the envelope and they'd stick it on a spike sticking up from a piece of wood. So you'd have a, a plank of wood with a spike sticking up a foot long, and they just stamp, put, the, put the covers on, and when the spike got full, they threw it in the basement. And in the 1900s, somebody discovered a basement full of postal history. So occasionally I find a judge who marks me down because my covers have holes in them. And it's like, well, there are no others. <laughs> so it's the holes is what you get. So that's a quirk of the Australian state's uh, 
the source of the supply of the supply of these things. Um, these printers aren't all that good at what they do. So if you notice here, notice the hair on the chin of the queen. Um, and this country has got a bit of a beard going on, a bit of a beard here. So maybe she's in lockdown and not getting proper grooming, but uh, <laughs> it's, I think it's sloppy printing and this pre-printed, pre-printing paper fold, pretty common. That happens in many places in the world. The other thing you see is lots of double perfs. You got a double perf up here. Um, they just don't, they just get perf double. Not that uncommon. They did an experiment in perforations, and this is going to test your eyeballs a little bit. So if you look at the, the one on the right, if you look closely, you can see it has a serrated roulette. They stamped a, a pattern of a, um, of a perforation in it. And they couldn't see it, so they didn't know it was done or whatever. So the next one they did, they put black stripe, black, the black roulette is meant to mimic where the, uh, is to show you where the roulette was. And then, of course, you get them with, um, after they rouletted them, they gummed the stamps. So the gumming sealed up the roulettes and they couldn't be separated. So they sent them back to the post office. And this one really stretches your eyeballs, but you can see there's there's serrated perforations and there's real perforations. So this thing could properly be done. And this one is done with both of the serrated perf, both the serrated roulettes, a, a plain one and a black one. Really uncommon on cover. One on cover popped up last week on eBay. And uh, I got, I bid 250 and I got seriously trounced in bidding for it. So they're pretty, very scarce on cover. They eventually did a uh, patriotic fundraising in 1900 for the Boer War. Um, stamps paid the one penny or two penny postage rates, but they cost you one shilling or two shilling. So that's a hack of a semi-postal. You're getting one penny of postage and you're donating 11 pennies to the, um, to the cause. So that's a major semi-postal. They're only legally usable in Queensland because they were not recognized by the UPU. So you can find them on covers, but they're all contrived, all the covers. There are no sort of really genuine ones that pass a straight face test. Large OS or OS perforations. Very common in the Australian states that you have OS or other perforations to indicate official stamps. Queensland has three OS perforators in use. One is this large OS perforator. And most people agree the one and the two penny are genuine. Um, not a lot of people agree that the rest of them are, although they are very, very constant, very consistent. And this group comes from a guy named Hugh Campbell, who is a, a very serious collector of this material. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they're, they're legit, but not broad agreement on that topic. They also issued small OS perforations. And these are the large OS ones. The OS, the holes were too big and the stamps tore when you tried to separate them. You, you tear down the OS instead of down the perforation where you're supposed to. Australia did the same thing. Australia's first series of kangaroo stamps had large OS perforations in them and they destroyed the stamps trying to tear them apart. So they switched to small ones. But it happened in Queensland five years earlier when they didn't learn or 10 years earlier. These are the small OS perforations used on, a couple used on cover. Um, Used abroad. So Queensland, through a quirk of colonization and legislation and a bunch of other stuff, Queensland ended up being the administrator of what was British New Guinea and later became Papua. The island of New Guinea is split vertically in half. The left half is Dutch New Guinea. The right half is top half German, bottom half British. Until the, uh, until the uh, First World War and then it becomes all British. But these are... Uh, stamps of Queensland used in British New Guinea. Um, again, the lower right, you've got that horrible yellow color. You can't tell it's a four penny, but it is. I Trust me, it is. Um, it's easy to see why you send you know, the treasurer, send something to the manager of the Union Bank of Australia. That makes sense. This guy, Pierre, Pierre Eric Segrin, made manufactured furniture for the, British, for the government of British New Guinea. So this was ordering a credenza or a desk or something. Who knows? 
And they also have them on um, the Government Gazette. Although Charles Woodford seems to be the only guy who put these aside and saved them. And there's no general agreement on whether it's a one penny or half penny postage rate. Who knows what they were trying to do at the time. Then we'll go into the other stuff. And there's lots of this here to talk about. Railway stamps. They start with this series, which are very unusual, hard to find. Then they go to a picture of a choo-choo train and some stamps, uh, different values. Um, some interesting varieties. One where the cab doesn't, this roof that's on the cab of the locomotive is missing in one of the stamps. There's a, a collectible variety. Then they switch to this style where there's a train on top. So it's obviously it's a railway something or other. And each town that has a railway post office, which is most of them, has a name on their stamp. So there's hundreds of each one of these values. This one penny, there's probably 200 different station names known on these stamps. Um, and sometimes they got lazy and just used the number. 116, and there's the barred numeral 116. The barred numeral for the railway station is not the same as the barred numeral for the town in which the railway station is located. And sometimes the guys took the mail down to the railway station and they whacked the mail with the railway canceller and vice versa. So it just makes it more entertaining and more confusing. And if you were a big enough user, you got your own stamps. So these are private users, Crib and Foot, Gordon and Gotch, TC Bierney. They're all um, private users of the railway. And there's a couple watermarks and a couple perforations. There's roulettes and there's fine purse. You can see on you know, there's, there's a real perforation here and there's no perforation on this guy and it's in pretty good shape. So lots of variations to pick through. Used on cover, just doing the task, pretty hard to find. But this is obviously sending that week's movie to the theater in, I guess it's pronounced Ganda, Ganda. Um, so they've, this is the label off the parcel. Um, another one, this is McWhorter's is a, uh, it's, the equivalent of Eaton's, I'll guess, at the time, an Australian department store that shifts stuff out from Brisbane. Brisbane's vast emporium, great big picture of this giant building. Um, and it goes into the decimal era. So in 1966, Australia becomes decimalized. They get rid of pounds, shillings, pence. And here's one from the Drug House Australia Limited, obviously shipping a package of something drug-like across the railways to somewhere, to King Arai. Revenue stamps. Australia has a revenue stamp for just about everything you can think of. Uh, not Australia, Queensland. Queensland has more revenue stamps than any other state by a long way. Um, and they change in size and shape and design and watermarks and perforations. Huge variation, huge variety. Adhesive duty stamps, paying a stampage fee on this. It's only a penny, but somebody had to pay it. Um, they go up to enormously high values. This one only goes to five shilling. It's not terribly high value, but it's, this is a stock transfer. Um, here's proofs of the decimal versions going up to $200. Um, there are some 2,000 pound ones in, the ser in some of the other series. Like it, yeah, here's one, it goes up to 500 pounds. So this is in the late 1800s. 500 pounds is real money real money at that time so then they have buffalo fly control stamps buffalo fly are a pest of the cattle industry so we'll wipe out the buffalo fly for you but you're going to pay a tax on every cow you sell to compensate for it so they have buffalo fly control stamps um they go up to two pounds i think here's some one pounds various pieces used they come on great big pieces of paper, ledger sheets out of some guy who's counting cows and toting up the taxes, and you got a ledger sheet that's, you know, two feet by three feet. And they, of course, become decimal. So here you've got so two dollars, one dollar, various decimal ones. They have swine sale stamps for the efforts in dealing with some sort of swine-related pestilence. Uh, you know, again, we'll we'll help wipe out your pestilence, but you got to pay. And postal notes, there's a poundage of three pence. So there's in fact a revenue charge here. So these are these are quite uncommon. Um, so this is a 10 shilling one. Here's a 
This is a 10 shilling one, but it's got a postmark, Field Post Office 073. So this is during the Second World War. And that field post office was located in New Guinea at the time. So somebody's sending his girlfriend 10 shillings or something, but it never got paid, never got paid out. So it ended up here. If you see one of these from Papua, let me know. I have the only known copy. So if you see another one from with Postal Note Papua, I really want to see it. Um, so they're pretty, pretty hard to find. And again, there are variations. There's uh, after a while, they print them about half the size because they're cheap. And Queen, instead of Queensland, it has Q, comma, or apostrophe LD to save on space and, and money. And some references. You want to go look this stuff up. The original book, Bassett Hall, printed in 1930. Kind of rare, kind of hard to find. Um, but it's the one that covers all the stamps to 1880. World War II had, there was a volume two that was, and there is a volume two rough draft Type, type draft someplace, but it never got done because of World War II. This guy, Ken Scudder, in 2013, took up the, the reins and did the last bit. <clears throat> Ups and Lowe's got really good information. Queensland Postal History is a, a book that sort of defines it, although there's a lot of modern web-based sources that are getting much better now. And all the Queensland Revenue Railway, this stamp, ozrevenues.com, is a great website. It's got every... Everything you could possibly conceive as being a railway stamp. There's jetty tax stamps. There's betting taxes. There's wage to unemployment insurance taxes. All manner of taxes for all the different states. A great resource. And that's it. Well, David, that was certainly interesting tonight. I don't know much about Australia. I have had the opportunity to visit once. And you're making me want to go back. Uh <laughs> Uh, you've certainly enlightened us, enlightened us in a number of areas. Uh, even though it was uh, miscellany, it was totally interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah.